Well, here we are on a cool fall day here in November, actually November 5th. Uh, okay, so today this video, I'm going to cut to the chase here. I'm going to, I'm going to um, give you some really, really direct um, and effective information on how to deal with, I guess you could say, a, a teen's uh, defiance and opposition, okay? Now, this is gonna be different than the one that I did before, and that's worth looking at as well, how to deal with defiance and opposition, oppositional behavior. Um, so that's what I'm about to explain in the next few minutes. If, but if you don't know, know who I am and you haven't watched my videos, my name is John Solano. I've been a practicing counselor for over 30 years, and over the last decade plus, I've been a family counselor working with specifically with families in high levels of conflict. So um, I've done, I've, I created this YouTube channel because parents over these many, many years have asked for more and more information. I also lead a parent leadership group. Yes, it's called Parent Leadership Group. And I've been doing that weekly for 10 years. It's a very, very powerful, very unique group. It's a drop-in group that's really a reflection of, of how people change. You know, I've been doing this work for, like I said, over 30 years as a counselor. And I see what's being offered in the community. And it all has its place and its time, I suppose. But I think when I look at people changing, and breaking bad habits or whatever they are, we all know that takes time. You can't just go to one workshop or one presentation or uh, six, six groups, you know, in a series and expect significant change. It takes time, you know, and a lot of these workshops and presentations and things and even spending time with the counselor can just be enough time to start getting pointed in a better direction and get some traction on something. But real change, takes time and you need support constantly through that. So the parent leadership group is a drop-in group. You come to one or as many as you want. Uh, again, on my YouTube channel, there's a video that explains what the parent leadership group is. If you're interested in that, then, um, which I highly recommend for everybody, it, you know, it, it, it focuses around parenting issues because we all want to be the best leaders that we can possibly be. But, but the information there is, is meant to transform people's lives in, in, in every aspect of your life. And of course, our relationships are just you know, our big component, but I mean our, our, our relationship with our sons or daughters or spouse or whatever it is, um, those are just pieces of anyone's particular life, right? There are a lot of different pieces, a lot of different facets. And so this, what's offered in this group can be helpful in everything. Um, so if you're interested in that, message me and, um, and I'll add your email address to our big parent list and you'll be one of 500 parents every week who get all sorts of resources and of course the invitation to the Zoom meeting. Highly recommended, as I said. And I wish more parents that I work with would, would sink their teeth into, into this um, and, and really sink their teeth into so many of the other things that are offered in the community. As parent leaders, we should be doing that. We should understand that, that again, uh, this thing we call growing up and maturing is a lifelong process. And so we need to be lifelong learners. And any good leader will want to continue to increase their awareness and increase their capacity to be effective in the world. So that group is there for you. All right, it's it's free. Um, so let's let's get to it here. Okay, so as you can imagine, in my line of work, like I said, over the last decade specifically, working with families who are in high levels of conflict. So I work with parents and teens who are consistently experiencing tension and conflict. Part of a re, or a major result, I guess you could say, of that tension and conflict is that there's often not a lot of cooperation on the part of the team. In fact, here is a, here is a, uh, let me share with you, I guess you could say, a, a summary of what I just experienced a couple of days ago working with a mom, a parent, single parent. She says, you know, my daughter 
uh, you know, she just will not participate in any of the supports that I provide. I arranged for this service or this service or this service. You know, she went to counseling, but she stopped going. Um, I'm frustrated with this. And, um, you know, I'm just worn out, just exhausted. No matter what I do, she's just, teen doesn't want to do it. Um, and so, you know, this is, again, this is a typical scenario of a parent extremely exhausted because they're trying to advocate for their child. In this situation, as many of these situations present, this is also involves a teen who doesn't want to be home. Doesn't want to be home, has expressed not wanting to be home, and has, you know, is on the verge of making arrangements to be elsewhere. I mean, this is typical, isn't it? When there's a lot of conflict or tension in the home, who in the heck would want to be at home? But this mother was saying to me, I don't know why this is happening. I'm so frustrated. And when she doesn't know what's happening, she starts to blame her daughter for it. Start to suggest that she's playing the victim role, that she's, um, you know, not telling the truth, um, that she somehow, you know, just wants other people to think that she's a bad mom. And, um, and then she also blames some extended family and other people in the community. And this all because mom says she doesn't understand why this go is going on. So this mom is really, really suffering. And then of course she's beating herself up a lot too, is, you know, because she's feels like she has failed. And so this is a very miserable state to be in, but very common. So I had to kind of cut to the chase. I mean, this mom's in a lot of suffering. I said, okay, you know, let me just connect a couple of dots here for you. Some stuff we already know, right? We already know that you and your daughter are, have been experiencing ongoing tension and conflict for quite some time. We know that there's some things that have gone on in your family history that have been upsetting that could be considered traumatic. We know that you've gotten some feedback from your extended family and even from your daughter that, that your daughter isn't happy about being home. So we know these things. You see, as a parent, you're going to have to take some educated guesses. A lot of times because your teen will not open up to you. Or if they do happen to open up, they kind of just blast you or whatever. Or maybe they're just cursing at you. But in probably 90% of the families and parents that I work with, they say, I don't know what's going on. My teen won't talk to me. So you're going to have to make some educated guesses here. And I said to this mom, you will, you will have to make some educated guesses. Why? Because you're the leader. Like we're talking about a teenager here. And in this case, it was a younger teenager, 13, I think 13, 14, barely a teenager. I say, you know, you're the adult here. So you have the, the mental capacity, the cognitive capacity to think this through to think way down the line, you want to be five steps ahead of her. You know, I said, most conflict, if you really pay attention to it, there's what is conflict? Conflict happens when people are at high levels of stress or distress. That causes people to kind of go into fight or flight. It, it kind of causes people to react in ways that are very predictable and very robotic. And it's all very reactive. So mom, you know, it's up to you to have the, capacity to reflect and to see what this young person might be your daughter might be dealing with what's going on what's causing this your daughter won't know she's just reacting but the good news is that if you can change some of your the ways you act and the ways you react maybe some things can shift but first of all we got to start to increase your awareness here so as i said we know some things from your history you know, you've gotten some feedback from family and from your daughter so at the end of the day, yeah, your daughter's not happy. Otherwise, she, you know, she'd be here. She actively doesn't want to be here, so there must be reasons for that. So this is what I call, okay, so what's happened here is that there's history on this. You and your daughter have been in intention and conflict for some time. There's a history of trauma. So your daughter has many grievances against you. She's not happy with you. 
She has many grievances against you. She has an internal file cabinet in her mind where she has kept note of all these grievances that she's experienced. Now, it doesn't matter whether those grievances are 100% accurate. They're accurate to her and they're valuable to her and they're meaningful for her, right? So you're gonna have to make sure that you do not do some of the things you've been doing, which is one, become defensive. In other words, try to defend yourself or enter into a debate with your daughter about the accuracy of her recollection. You don't wanna do those things, right? These are real for her. So what you wanna do is listen, if we get a chance for her to talk. Right now she doesn't wanna to talk to you. So we have to, we're gonna to have to work on creating that line of communication. But here's the deal, all right? She has many grievances against you. What you need to understand is that there are so many grievances, and this is not just for you guys, this is how it works psychologically. When we pile up grievances, against somebody, it begins to distort our perception of the person. So your daughter has a perception of you right now of an enemy. Your daughter, you are on your daughter's bad list. You are on your daughter's black list, whatever you want to call it. She sees you as an adversary. She sees you as an enemy. Now here you are, also very stressed out, and feeling guilty and all sorts of things. So now you're trying to advocate for her to get help for her. And yet you yourself are really in need of help because your levels of stress and distress and guilt are, you know, the needles getting pegged for you. So if your daughter would just engage with some counseling and some of the supports that you've arranged for her, then that would alleviate your guilt and your stress. Now, if you're her enemy, does she want to do you any favors? Does anybody want to do their enemy any favors? The answer obviously is no. And this is why your daughter is declining services. This is why your daughter is dragging her feet when it comes to engaging services. This is why she's dropping out of services because she sees you as an enemy. Why does she see you as an enemy? Because she has multiple grievances, unaddressed grievances against you. Now you're sitting here telling me, mom, that you don't know why your daughter has walked away. You don't know why your daughter is declining services. Does this make some sense now? She has multiple grievances against you. This, this tension and conflict between the two of you has been going on for years. And then there's the other traumatic events that are like throwing gasoline on the fire. So of course, now when you're, when you open your mouth as a mom, I mean, you can, you can, first of all, you can try to fool yourself and say that you're, you're providing these advocacy services or doing this advocacy on behalf, on behalf of your daughter. That's a half truth. Yes, you love and care for her. And some of the advocacy you're doing is because of that. Let's just say for the sake of conversation that the other half is fueled by your own anxiety and guilt. So when somebody, when somebody feels hard done by you, mom, and you become their enemy, another way of saying it is that, is that, and what's going on in your daughter's head is that, why should I care about you? You never cared about me. You made my life hell, so now I wanna make your life hell. This is a little bit of that game of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? You made my life hard and difficult, I'm gonna make your life hard and difficult. Of course, this goes on subconsciously, but these two pieces are together all the time. What are those two pieces? Some people call it victim victimizer, sometimes victim oppressor or sometimes uh, offense or defensive and offensive positions, or sometimes it's revenge. I don't know why the world and clinicians and other people don't pursue this avenue more. I mean, I can literally tell you, I can have a conversation with a youth who's doing this and in a matter of probably 
three to six or seven minutes, I can have them admitting that they're getting revenge on their parents. This is, this is not hard to see. This is not hard to access. But it's almost the elephant in the living room that nobody wants to talk about. So mom, yes, you're exhausted. Can you see what's going on here? You're trying to advocate for your daughter. First of all, your own, you're your own worst enemy because you have some stress and distress and guilt that you're experiencing that you haven't dealt with. And that's causing you to become overzealous in your wanting to advocate. Your daughter can sense that a mile away that you're trying to get her to alleviate your anxiety. You are her enemy. She is not going to help you with that task. Does that make sense? Okay, so here's really what I wanted to get to. Mom's gonna go, okay, what do I do? Because I obviously, and mom has already come to this conclusion. I, I put in all this effort, it doesn't work, right? You can't use that strategy, not now. You can't use that strategy. The more you do it, the more you get exhausted, the more you get exhausted and frustrated, the more you feel guilty, the more anxiety goes up, the more you project that onto your daughter. Yeah, it's getting ugly. This is going to escalate. Your daughter is not going to come home. Your daughter is not going to come home until she feels safe enough to come home. What do you need to do? Well, a couple of things. One, here, okay, folks, here, remember what I said. Daughter has a file cabinet full of, remember what they are? Grievances, all right? Now, here's, here's usually what a parent will try to do. Okay, I get it, John, I get it, okay. And I'll say, well, how, how do we deal with grievances? If somebody has a grievance against you, what are you going to do about it? Like it's, it's like you got to take the wind out of their sails. What are you going to do about it? Well, you're, you're going to approach them and be accountable for what the grievance might be. But, but usually the first attempt by a person, first, second, third attempt by a parent, especially a parent who is, hasn't really done a lot of self-care work or a lot of therapy or just kind of a lot of introspection, introspective work, they're going to say, okay, well, I'll apologize to her. What are you going to say? Well, I'm just going to tell her that I'm sorry. Oh, really? You think that's going to work? See, this is the shotgun approach. This is like one size fits all. It's kind of, you're going to give this blanket apology when she's made specific note of, let's say, a dozen grievances. That's not going to work. That's why you're going to have to take some educated guesses here about what those grievances could be. Come on, it can't be that hard. Think about just this last week and this last conflict that you guys, what happened? You let your emotions get the best of you, right? Maybe you said some things that you wish you wouldn't have said. Start accounting for that. Start accounting for, for what's right in your face. What happened the most recently? Because then you have some, some detailed recollection of it. She remembers it in detail. A blanket apology is not going to satisfy. So try to try to sift back through the relationship over the years and start with what is most recent, but start to work back and, and certainly try to recall those conflicts or moments of, of uh, you know, those arguments that have been most significant, most hurtful, things that you've said that have been most hurtful. Start there. Because every one of these grievances that you can address are going to take the wind out of her sails. See, she can't, she can't do what she's doing without the stack of evidence against you. So start to whittle away at that stack of evidence. She can't hold so much against you. That'll start creating opportunity for conversation. So this is all about personal responsibility. Step one, parent, good leaders demonstrate significantly, you know, consistent levels of personal accountability. Don't, don't expect your 13 year old or your 17 year old or say even some adults who don't have the capacity, don't expect them to demonstrate it. You're the leader. Show by example how this is done. Okay. And start with your most recent thing that you can recall. Move towards her. Even if, if you can't speak to her directly, do it in a text. Do it in a Snapchat, Instagram video, whatever, but do it. Do it, write a letter if you need to, you know? But there, it, it's important for you to do that. Why? To restore your own integrity. This is how you repair a relationship, all right? Okay, <clears throat> now your daughter, 
is sticking it to you. If this is an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. She's saying, you didn't care about me, why should I care about you? Your daughter would not be taking this tact, if you will, implying this strategy, unless somewhere underneath there, she does care deeply. But this strategy, this idea that she's entertaining, this narrative is actually covering that up now. So it's like this virtue of caring that she has is now buried. It's a, it's, she's disconnected from it. All right? So this is what you do. When your daughter, when your teen is disconnected from their best self, from their core convictions, from their core values, you remind them of them. Remind them of who they truly are. Remind them of their best self. Okay. Step one, be an ally. Got it? Write that down. Step one, be an ally. What does that mean? Remember what I said. You're being seen as an enemy. You're being seen as an enemy. You're not an ally right now. See, if, if, if you're an enemy, you're going to, anything that, anything you do, try to do, anything you try to say is going to be met with what? Defiance and opposition. Defiance and opposition. You have gotten yourself in this role of being an enemy. Now, do you understand how important it is to be an ally and not an enemy? Step one, be an ally. I have written an article about this called Be an Ally, Not an Enemy. If you're interested in that article, message me, give me your email address, I'll get that to you. <clears throat> be an ally. How do you be an ally? Well, you might say, if you have an opportunity for conversation, you might say, you know, I know it's been a difficult past couple of years. You must feel, feel very hurt. Now you're creating, you're, you're, you're coming up alongside somebody. You're not opposed to somebody. You're by their side now saying, you're, you're, you're demonstrating understanding. I understand. So now let's say in this situation, mom has a daughter who wants to leave home. Instead of the mom saying, you can't leave, you need to stay home. You can't go here, you can't go there. See, a response like that is gonna elicit immediate defiance, right, and opposition, and it's gonna to lead to indulgence on the part of the teen, okay? So that might be the emotional response when a parent lets their emotions get the best of them. You can't leave. You know, I, I didn't say you could go, what have you. What you might say, be an ally. Be an ally and say, you know, I know it's been pretty hard around here. And, you know, I get that that uh, it would it might feel better to, to go to a friend's house or to go to a relative's house. I get that. This is another way of saying something that I say to parents all the time. Relationship first, task second. Relationship first, task second. When parents are under stress, they go to task first. And, and the relationship goes out the window or down the toilet, or wherever. Remember, this is about getting cooperation, parents. And you're not going to get cooperation from somebody who sees you as an enemy. Relationship first, task second. Creating a relationship, how are you going to do it? By being an ally. I'm going to be an ally. Yes, I, I get it. I kind of get this. It's been hard around here the last couple of weeks, and you know sometimes I've been a, a bit critical. I get that, and it can feel like it'd be easier to be elsewhere. Right? Now, write this down. Here is the transition. Here is the big transition. So what you've done, you become an ally. Now you go and, and you words, not the word, but mm -mm 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 -mm. and, and you say this <clears throat> and what I know about you. Did you write that down? And what I know about you. 
Or you could say, and what I've always known about you. Or and what I've always witnessed in you. Something like this. But keep it simple at first. And what I know about you is. So this is what I call, remember what I was saying is that when, when our teens are in revenge mode, they're not being their best self. And so I have to help them remember their best self. I have to point towards something that already exists within them, which we were going to call core virtues or values. So I will say, and what, you know, what I've always known about you is that you're a mature, caring, and loving daughter. You've always been a mature, caring, loving person. You've always been a mature, caring, and forgiving person. See, so now I'm reminding the person of the best of who they are. I'm reminding them of what I call their code of honor. I'm reminding them of values that they hold dear. So, you see how I put the two together? Number one, be an ally. Yes, it's been hard around here these last couple of years, and I've often been critical of you. I'm very sorry for that, and it must feel like you probably don't even want to be around here. And, and what I've always known about you is that you're a loving, a caring, responsible, forgiving person. See, relationship first, task second. Ally first, remind of virtues, and then on the back end, maybe there's a little suggestion that something happened. See, what happens is that when parents are scared and in distress, they immediately try to jump in and do stuff. You know, they're scared about their kid headed in the wrong direction or whatever's going on for them. So they immediately get on the phone, immediately get on the phone, start doing stuff, start calling this program and this program and the doctor and the therapist and the psychiatrist and you start doing, 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 doing. Remember though, at this point, your son or daughter sees you as an enemy. So they're going to go in their mind going, okay, yeah, you're going to, you're going to try to do a good deed here and help me, but you're really probably doing this more for yourself because you're all stressed out. So you want me to change, but you don't want to do any change in yourself. So screw that. <clears throat> but I'm going to let you go through all this work to, because, you know, who can stop you? And, and then when you present me with these options, I'm going to say, eh, no, I don't really, you know, the last time I went to counseling didn't work. Um, yeah, you know, I, I'm not interested or you're the one who needs the counseling, not me. So there'll be all this defiance and opposition that starts to show up. You're the enemy. Don't forget that. You need to change that position. You need to become an ally first. So all this doing stuff that, that we all do as human beings when we're under stress, because none of us like being under stress or high levels of distress. So right away, our, our human mind says, hey, well, can, let's do something about this. In this case, fight off that temptation. It ain't going to work. It never has worked. You told me it didn't work. It's not going to work. Here's what's going to work. Forget what you're doing. Become something. What does your son or daughter need you to be right now? Right now, you're being an enemy. Your son or daughter needs you to be an ally. Not to do anything, but to be something for them. Be an ally. Number one, you got to get that. I wish there was something on this video that you could give me some feedback to say you get it because you got to get this. If there's been long standing tension and conflict, if there's been trauma in the history, there are grievances that have not been addressed. And when there's multiple grievances, you have become the adversary. You have become the enemy. So understand, get that, get your head around that because as long as you're the enemy, any effort you put in towards advocacy is going to go down the drain and you're going to be super exhausted and you're going to feel heartbroken and you're going to feel disrespected amongst many, many other nasty feelings. And that'll be not your child's fault. 
it'll be yours. And I say fault very lightly because this is what we do, but you are the leader in the family and, and you really want to know what you're up against. Okay. So we got it written down ally first. And what I know about you is now you're pointing to the virtues. And then at the end, last step, you know, is, is there, is there a step that we might be able to take together? Or it could sound like this, listen to this. Okay. Yeah. It's hard around here. And what I know about you is that you're always a mature and caring and forgiving young person. And I know you would want the best for yourself. So is there a step here that you think that you might want to take? So I keep myself as the parent completely out of it. Why? Because again, I'm, I'm starting off here as an enemy. So any, any sense that the, that the teen gets of my involvement could trigger defiance and opposition. So I want to, I can try to keep the ball completely in their court. I'm doing, I'm becoming an ally. I'm being accountable. So yes, I know that I've been critical this last year or a couple of years, or I've been preoccupied with my own anxiety and guilt and I haven't been there for you. And you know what I know about you is that you've always been a mature, responsible, loving, forgiving person. And I know you would want, you know, you do want a good life for yourself. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, uh, I'm sure you'll, you know, you know, you'll take a step here or, you know, you may want to take a step or maybe, you know, I'm guessing you'll want to take some action out of this, but I need to, to maintain my distance, not get my hands into the cookie jar on this one because they're just going to get slapped if that happens. All right. So you get the three phases again, be an ally and point to virtues and then suggest maybe a possible action step. Example, let me give you another example. Parents complaining a lot that their child is not attending school. The child says, well, yeah, I don't want to go to school because I'm anxious. I have a headache. I have a stomach ache. What have you? Right? Okay. Be an ally. Yeah. You know, uh, it can be tough. You know, when you, you know, you, you don't, you know, you don't feel like going to school, it's be way, you know, more comfortable to just stay at home today and, and maybe feel like you could go back another day. I get that. And you know what I've always known about you though, is that you've always been responsible and, and uh, you know, just a strong person. And yeah, I know you've always wanted the best for yourself. Pause, right? Let that set. Let that set. That's what we call creating cognitive dissonance, right? That's what you do for all of us. It's kind of like we, we're, we're making maybe involved in actions or inactions that aren't a true reflection of who we really are. And, and then somebody says, hey, you know, I know you're always a go-getter and, you know, you've always kind of faced whatever barriers you've had, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'd have to think about that and go, yeah, I guess they're right. You know, <laughs> when they remind us of our best self. And then we, then we want to take a, a step. And so you could just say that. You could say this over and over and over again. It, it, this, is, this has to be a discipline. It has to be a repetitive process in which you're, it's almost like you're inflating something that has been deflated. You know, when we talk about deflation, it's kind of like taking the air out of something. Well, these positive attributes of your child, these virtues or values, like caring and compassion and strength, et cetera, um, are a bit deflated. So you have to blow air into them. We call it inspiration. Breath, inspirati. You, you inspire. That's how you inspire. You say, you know, what I've always known about you is that you're a mature, respons responsible, and loving individual. And you've always, you know, you've always had self-respect. You might say, I don't know, you know, I don't know how to, you know, what step to take next, but let's talk about it in a little bit. See, what I've done is I've just, I've just inflated those virtues. I've just inf put a little air into it, but they not, might not be full enough for somebody to take any action. So I'll find opportunities to keep inspiring, to keep inflating, to keep 
pointing to those virtues that are now buried under some of this negative uh, internal dialogue and what we might call narrative. All right. So this video has been longer, but I feel as though I've kind of uh, hammered this a bit better. So if you walk away from this video today, understanding this psychological dynamic, okay, of tension and conflict, starting with grievances, with multiple grievances, distort a person's perception to the degree that the person who they feel have, have done, you know, have not done them right, becomes an enemy. And when you're an enemy, you will not get cooperation from your team because we don't help our enemies. So then you have to become an ally. How do you become an ally? Right? You step forward in a relationship mode. Try to relate to what's going on. Yes, this can be difficult. Or you can uh, demonstrate personal accountability and says, yes, this has been a hard last year. And I've been critical on many occasions. And, you, and you know, I, I get that you feel like you don't even want to be here. Am I hearing that correctly? Yeah. However, or and, you know what I know about you? You know what I've really appreciated about you? Da 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 da. You can leave it there. Or if it feels like your teen is receptive, you can might say, well, well, you know, is there a step that we might be willing to take today? How about, uh, you know, I, I get that you don't want to go to school. I know you do want to go to school because you've always been responsible and caring and you wanted the best for yourself. Is there a tiny step that we can take today? How about a, how about a half a day of school? How about, uh, you know, I drive you to school and we talk to a school counselor and work something out. You can talk if there's a possibility of, of strategizing practical steps, but that'll come to at the end. Okay, if you walk away from this video understanding that all that stuff, then good for you. You're being a parent leader. You're understanding what you're up against. You're understanding the lay of the land. And now you can take some, you utilize some strategies that we just talked about that will be effective. But stay away from things like using words like you need to, you have to, you better, you should, do it because I said. You say those things, that is gonna fire up so much defiance and opposition. You, you know, you're, you're, that'll escalate the entire situation. Stay away from those things. Stay away from lecturing, advice giving, and, and counsel. Don't share your knowledge or your wisdom. Remember, you already tried all that and it didn't work. All those things now are going to become an irritant. They're going to escalate the situation. All right? It's not about all that. It's not about you. It's about the love that you have and your promise to love and respect your child so they can build skill and capacity to become an authentic and unique human being as they were born to be. All right. Take care and have a good day.